Hello and welcome to this special edition of We the People. I'm Rida Fakhri. Americans from Texas to Tennessee are beginning to share the developing world's pain from the global water crisis. This problem knows no geographic or economic boundaries. At least 36 of America's 50 states are expected to experience water shortages over the next four years. Lavish lifestyles in the U.S. have contributed to this, but it is America's denial of water as a precious and diminishing resource that could lead the country into a crisis far greater than its dependency on foreign oil. Like much of the world already knows, we could live without oil, but we cannot live without water. Award-winning correspondent Mike Saray visited four corners of the United States, revealing a dramatic illustration of both the dimensions of the problem and its growing impact on everyday life in America. From the southeast in Atlanta, Georgia, which came within 90 days of losing its primary water source due to drought and poor planning. We're a community, a population who have felt we always had a lot of water. And now we're realizing that this water is a finite resource. To the southwest in El Paso, Texas, where residents are being paid to replace their water-wasting lawns and old toilets to save their shrinking aquifers. When I get in the, uh, the rainfall and the snowfalls that we used to have that, that uh, you know, put, put some of this water back into these uh, aqua basins. Americans' ever-growing demands for water are exceeding its traditional sources, even in areas like the rain-drenched Pacific Northwest. Our sense of security, our reliable water supply, the thing that was absolute for 97 years, is not absolute anymore. The mighty Rio Grande, once one of the great rivers of the world, is now nothing more than a dirt road separating Mexico from the United States and the Texas border. Much of the water has been diverted further upstream for agricultural needs and growing metropolitan needs for places like El Paso. Many of those migrating to the United States from a developing country like Mexico mistakenly thought they had left their water problems behind. Romelia Galvan and her son haven't had running water since they moved across the border from Juarez, Mexico for what they hoped would be a more comfortable life in America on the outskirts of El Paso, Texas. We use the roof uh, to collect the water as it drips down, letting it, positioning these buckets and tanks wherever, they, wherever it drips um, up until they fill up. Like thousands of Mexican-Americans living in these communities along the Texas border called colonias. Use, use that old method of uh, placing it inside the bucket. She and her son, Hernan, spend a disproportionate part of their day and basic living expenses, collecting and buying water while waiting for a hookup to their local water district. They say that down in Mexico it's real easy to get it. I can't understand why over here in the United States it's real hard to just bring it up, not even about a mile away, a uh -huh. mile, mile and a half away from where I'm at, and I can't get the water up here. It's made daily life particularly difficult for Sinobio Chavez, a disabled truck driver living on the outskirts of El Paso. He depends on whatever water he can collect off his roof to supplement whatever water he can afford to buy from a water tanker truck. As you can tell, we're at a higher ground and it's, it'd be way too expensive to really uh, get a drilling rig to come out here and, and drill a, a well. The only water utility these families can rely on is Ernie Lugano's tanker truck. In the hot summer months, they often have to track them down when their tanks unexpectedly run dry. 2,500 gallons around this area, we're charging $50 a load. And um, usually, out in the summertime, I would say maybe two weeks will will last the uh, 2,500 gallons. So your water costs are what? About $200 a month? Two, two, $300 a month, perhaps. Uh-huh. That's a, a good chunk of our income for the month. The social services team from the University of Texas, El Paso, say these border families, lacking running water and proper sanitation facilities, are three times more likely than other Texans to suffer from dysentery and hepatitis A. Their water-related disease rates are comparable to Mexico and other developing countries. 
<laughs> when Rosario Ramirez's family of nine wants to take showers, she says they have to go back to Juarez, Mexico. It was just the same as here as it is there. Sometimes, in and sometimes they did have they did have um, connections to the city water, but also sometimes they didn't have to carry water like in, like we do here. Well, I know the colonias have problems with water distribution, and you probably see uh, in the colonias water tanks the, distributing water from house to house, and and that's something that you see in Mexico too. Although Mexico has some areas with with good distribution of water, uh, for the most part. Uh, our counterparts in Ciudad Juarez use less water per person per day than we do here. Juarez, Mexico and El Paso, Texas rely on the same aquifers beneath the desert and the ever diminishing resources of the Rio Grande River separating them. Uh, water crises are, are different from place to place. Uh, one of the challenges that we face living in a desert is there's always, uh, I wouldn't say there's always a crisis, but you always need to be thinking about it. It's always in the forefront of everybody's thinking. After thinking about how to tap more of its underground but often brackish water resources, El Paso built the world's largest inland desalination plant in the middle of the desert of all places to deal with its ever-growing needs for more water for everyone. We treat it like gold out here. On the other side of the border, they, they, they got more privileges over there of, of, of uh, getting water than, than I do of, of getting it down here. between different cultures over traditional sources of water are as old as civilization itself. Along the Klamath River here in the Pacific Northwest, upstream farmers in Oregon have been battling downstream fishermen in California over their respective water rights to the river. We're placed here on, on the Klamath River. The best place to catch fish in the world is the Klamath River. This is one of the best places right out here. Um, you can't beat it. It's central to our culture. Like most other countries, agriculture places the greatest demand on America's traditional sources of water. Farmers and food processors use an estimated 75% of the country's fresh water. We're trying to preserve a way of life. I've spent all of my life. My father spent all of his life. His, my grandfather spent all of his life uh, developing a pretty, pretty nice farm. And uh, I'd like to perpetuate that. American Indian tribes living along the Klamath River also lay claim to the water for the salmon fishing their families have depended on for centuries. A birthright they believe has been guaranteed to them by treaties they've signed with the United States government over the years. Salmon is everything to the Yurok tribe and Yurok people. Unless we do something uh, to increase the populations of fish to sufficient levels, then our fishing right really isn't going to be meaningful. And that took us right smack dab to the water. It took us to water allocation issues, water management issues. This decade-long battle over water allocations from the Klamath River came to a head in 2001, when federal agencies responsible for the fisheries declared two species of local fish to be endangered. Water allocations to the farmers upstream were shut off to provide more water downstream for the fish to return to their spawning areas along the river. Saw so a lot of my neighbors go out of business. Our sense of security, our reliable water supply, the thing that was absolute for 97 years, is not absolute anymore. And when you're farming this country without water or without a reliable supply of water, your risks in, increase a thousandfold. The farmers got their water allocations back the following year which happened to be a particularly dry year and a disaster for the fishermen downstream. We were pleading with reclamation officials to give us some more uh, water. About we a talking. month and a half later, we had the lar one of the largest fish kills that's ever been recorded on the West Coast. I had over, well over 33,000 adult salmon die right in, within the boundaries of the Yurok Reservation. It was an ill feeling when, if you got out down the river in the morning and come down the river and look at all the fish laying along the banks. It was ill. It was real ill feeling. It was just, just like death. You know? 
the time fish need water is the same time that the agricultural needs water. And they're not taking 2% out, they're taking about 40% of the Klamath out, depending on how much water is put down. So they're taking a significant amount of water out of the main stem Klamath, and it's impacting our fish negatively. For more than a decade now, the battle lines have been drawn on the river, in the local courts, and with the federal agencies over what the farmers and fishermen both believe to be their inalienable rights to the Klamath River's water. And it's getting personal. You are white man's the only species being considered. Claim the native people, claim the officials. You didn't come here with water, you don't leave with water. My pain is right here, my babies. My baby's pain, not being able to go out and fish it's something for thousands. Happen. Your ancestors cause their pain? Grow up. You're fighting for one fish. How much cat food is made out of salmon every day? Did you ever think of that? The growing demands on traditional water sources like the Klamath River, combined with climate changes, are beginning to impact the American way of life in many parts of the country. Access to water has never been an issue like it is today.